something? You might be surprised to find that they're actually supported by every single browser, including Edge, yes, as of April. And I, uh, in case you're wondering what these versions actually, how these versions actually translate to market share, I've loaded, whoa, <clears throat> I have loaded, and I'm trying to load again, but nope. This would have been a kind of use page about CSS variables, which also, also shows market share percentages. Come on. Really? <coughs> okay, I'm going to give it a few more seconds and then give up. Anyway, this was showing that the market share globally is like something like 85%. And specifically in Greece, it's over 90%. Because uh, when, you, when you go to Canada, you, you can select specific countries. So you're lucky. In Greece, the percentage of CSS variable support is actually better than the average. And sure, it's not 100%. I mean, almost nothing is. But there are techniques you can use if extreme perfect browser support is, it matters a lot to you. Like maybe you run, maybe you work on a huge website where even 1% market share is important. So app supports comes to the rescue. App supports is a rule. Um, how many of you have used or, or, heard, or at least heard of Modernizer? Most of you, excellent. So app supports is like the native CSS version of Modernizer. Instead of having to load a separate library and use weird classes about predefined things, you can test every single, any, any property and value you can think of, including multiple if you want to test like with prefixes. Um, and only apply CSS if this feature is supported or not supported. In this case, when you want to detect CSS variables, using any CSS variable and any value works. So I, I like to use dust dust CSS variables because it kind of reads nice, like at support CSS variables. So that way you can basically special case any CSS you want to only serve it to browsers that do or don't support CSS variables, which gives you a lot of fine-grained support, um, fine-grained behavior. Of course, ad supports only helps you with browsers that actually support the ad supports rule, but that is a much wider set than browsers that support CSS variables. Another thing to keep in mind for those of you that are coming from programming or SAS is that CSS variables don't exactly work in the way you're used to. So here I have this div that I've sized at 33 um, VW units and the height is 33 VH units. So I want it to be 33 of the viewport horizontally and 33 of the viewport um, vertically. And I'm thinking, what if I wanted to make it 30%? I have to change this in two places. This is not dry. This is not a good idea. I shouldn't have to change things in multiple places. So I think I can have a variable here and define that as 30. And then I can go here, call my variable like this. And then I notice that it doesn't work. Suddenly nothing works. It's as if I haven't specified a width and height. And the reason is that this is actually invalid because the browser sees size as a number and adding a VW after it doesn't make a difference. It still sees a number and a VW identifier. It doesn't see a length with a unit. You cannot change the actual parsing by <coughs> using variables. Like you cannot change tokens into another type of token. So what the browser sees here is basically this. It's equivalent to this. Or, or this, you know, it would be the same if you had white space there, which is clearly invalid. So what can you do? Does that mean you cannot actually do what you wanted? Of course not. As, as is common with CSS, there usually is a way to do what you wanted, just very, very verbose. You can use the calc function and multiply one pH 
with the value of your variable. Now it works. And you can do the same here with the age. And now it works. It's kind of horrible, but it works. Now you might be thinking, I don't like these two colors. Why? Here's an idea. I can use the H here, and that that, give, that, make, that helps me get rid of the first color. And here, you can just divide by one V and VWs, like primary school math, right? No. As is also common with CSS, what you expect to work doesn't work. So. The reason this doesn't work is that you can't actually divide by lengths. You can only divide by numbers in calc. Soon you will be able to divide by lengths, but not yet. The reason, if you're interested um, in the nitty gritty, the reason you cannot divide by lengths is that when calc was defined, calc was defined much uh, long before variables, and there was no concept of invalid and computed value time back then. So we were like, what happens when you're trying to divide by zero. What do we do there? There was nothing we could do, so you can't divide by lengths. So if you have a number, you can convert it to a unit, like uh, to a length, by just multiplying with one of that unit. But if you have a unit, you cannot convert it to a number. There's simply no CSS-based way to convert it to a number. It, you just can't do it. Which brings us to the sixth takeaway. You should use variables for pure data not CSS values. You can always convert them to, to convert it to the CSS value you need, but you cannot convert <laughs> it back. So some of you, how many of you have used CSS animations? Most of you, excellent. So here I have a very simple animation. It just goes from yellow to blue, uh, infinitely. And you might be thinking, I have a cool use for variables. I can use them in, in animations. Wouldn't that be cool? So I try to use, to do that. I set background color to some VG variable and defining it here. <laughs> you can already see, see I'm breaking my animation. What happened here? There's no smooth animation anymore. It just goes from blue to yellow. The thing is, even though CSS variables are token lists, the browser still pretends it doesn't know how to animate them. Probably because it sees like this, this white space in the beginning and the color afterwards, and it doesn't quite know what to do with that. Um, so it's throwing its hands up in the air, and it's like, I don't know how to animate this. I'll just do whatever I do with other properties that are not interpolatable. Like if you try to animate display or any, like any, property that is not interpolatable, this is what will happen. The actual quote from the spec is, CSS variables can even be transitioned or animated, but since the UA has no way to interpret their contents, they always use the flips at 50% behavior, which is what we just saw, that is used for any other pair of values that cannot be intelligently interpolated. So the seventh takeaway is that CSS variables plus animations split ice cream. But there is hope. In the near future, we'll be able to use JavaScript. Yeah, sadly, not CSS. This should really be a CSS thing, but at least that's better than nothing. We'll be able to use um, JavaScript to define uh, metadata for our custom properties, such as what is their syntax, what is their initial value if they're not set, do they actually inherit so we don't have to do the trick to disable inheritance? However, the browser support for this is quite spotty. And you, you'll see soon why you have a question mark in Chrome. So I'm in Chrome right now. And it supports this function behind the flag. And I will try to run it. Once I press this button, it runs this code. So I'm going to try to do that. You're thinking nothing happened, but let's go through the demo again. Whoops. This is what happens right now. This is what happens if you try to call this function while you have, after you have already used a CSS property. I hear it's fixed in Canary, but at least in stable Chrome, 
this is what you get. Thankfully, I can, I can just refresh. Of course, then I would have to do it again. But in this case, I'm going to go and run it before I actually use the custom property. Hopefully, it should work. Chrome becomes really unstable after I run this, so you might see random crashes. But don't worry, we can always refresh. OK, so I've run it. Let's try. Fingers crossed. And now I'm going here, setting to G. Ooh, something's happening. <coughs> See? I now got a smooth animation. And soon it won't crash your browser either. <laughs> also, um, of course, transitions have exactly the same behavior. You can no transition CSS variables unless you've defined them. But here's an interesting thing I noticed a while ago. So I had this transition, uh, something was a certain color, and then uh, on a given pseudo class, in this case, active. So if I click here, I'm pressing the mouse now. <coughs> if I click here, it becomes active, and you get blue. And you see that there's a smooth transition. I could change this to use a variable, not PG, because we've already defined that one, another one. And then I can change that the transition is between two variables. But you, and you can see, even though it's only the variable that's, that's changing now, I'm still getting a smooth transition. What happened? So when I first came across this, I tweeted, huh, so CSS variables don't work in animations, but they work in transitions? What? But it turns out they actually do. It's a trick. It's a trap. If you restrict your transition to the background variable, you can see that there's no transition anymore. It's actually still the background that's transitioning. See, if I restrict it to the background, I still get the nice smooth transition. What's actually happening here is that the variable is triggering a change in background. And because background is animatable, you get a smooth transition. So here's another takeaway. CSS variables can still trigger transitions. Now let's go to some common use cases. This is pretty much the most basic component of all kinds, a button. It has a variation, a pink button. And here's the CSS about it. As you can see, I had to define the, the same color multiple times for the variation. So how can CSS variables help us here? <coughs> Let's try to use a color variable for the main. All right, there's this hover effect. So let's try to use a, a, a color variable and define our color there. And I'll use this in every place I've defined black here. As you can see, it works exactly the same. You might be thinking, but wait a second, you still have the same amount of code. OK, you can, only, you can change black in one place now, but it hasn't really reduced your amount of code here. But wait a second until we go to the variation. Here we can just get rid of all our theming code and reduce it to just one declaration. And it works exactly the same. And what's more, I don't need to have special classes anymore that override, uh, that override my CSS rules. This is a declaration I could actually just go and put anywhere, even in an inline style or by JavaScript. So basically, now I can have infinite variations. <laughs> and what's, what's more is that this doesn't just offer you less uh, maintainability and less code. It also offers you encapsulation. Now, I don't need to care how you've implemented, how, how you've styled your component so that I can style it. I can style your component without having any clue what you're doing in there and what, how you've styled it. I don't need to look at your CSS to theme your component. I can just use whatever CSS uh, variable you've exposed. So let's say here, for a practical case, 
You see how when I'm hovering over this button, it's just going into the, the background's just flipping to the other color? What if I wanted a smooth transition there? And not just the kind of transition I would get with the transition property. What if I wanted the, back, the, the border to kind of grow inside the button? So how can I do that? Instead of background, I can just use box shadow with zero offsets, zero blur, and positive spread with this color and inset. And I can get rid of my background decoration. Oh, and I need, and I need a transition. Let's make it one second. And now you can see how it works. So the thing is, if, if, if someone else was styling my component, was keeping my component without CSS variables, they would have to know that I made this change. And they would have to change their own code. But now, they don't have to change anything. Because their color declaration still works. They, they have this blue version of the button, and my change just rolls out to it. They don't have to know anything. So the nice takeaway is that CSS variables enable theming independent of CSS structure which is something you absolutely could not do with SAS variables. Another thing is, notice that here I'm setting the color, uh, I'm setting the color variable to black, which is sort of an initial value. But in the real world, I, 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 that's not a good practice. It's simple here, but it's not a good practice because in the real world, I wouldn't be styling just the button. I would be styling like, dot my button component whatever or if you're if you're not using them or anything and you're using like plain descendant selectors it could be like dot my container um, white space dot the button dot something and the more the higher specificity my rule would have the higher specificity uh, people would need to have to override the variable declaration so ideally I shouldn't have any color declaration but then what happens in the default case? I'm not getting anything there because everything, every, the, the variable is, is, is initial, everything, everything goes to its initial value, like I get no border. So this is where the pullback comes in. I can just set, let's break this a bit. I can just set the pullback here. And where else? And that works again, and the theming still works. But isn't this a bit repetitive? I've basically repeated my pullback three times. Sure, I could use a variable for the pullback as well, and then use the variable as a, a variable as the pullback. But then I would end up with really long var declarations in every single place I want to use color. Instead, I can do something else. I can define a new variable, let's call it color D, and give that value to that variable. So that variable has a callback. And then I can just use color D here. So how is this better than before? You might be thinking, but you still have a color D declaration in your rule. But the thing is, people styling my component do not have to know about color D. They only know about color. And color is not actually set anywhere. So color D is basically sort of the equivalent of a private variable. It's, it's by convention. They can still override it if they want. But in your documentation, or in your style guide, you say it's the color variable that you use for, for theming. And then internally, you use this one that actually has a pullback. So the third takeaway is also that default default values are possible by just using another variable. Another uh, good use of CSS variables is responsive design. Often you have to write multiple rules just to change one thing. Whereas with variables, you can just define one declaration that sets, for example, the gutter in a grid. And let's go out of full screen mode to show you how this works. You can see here our changes. So let 
take away CSS variables make responsive design easier. And now let's go into some cool use cases after seeing common use cases. Uh, until recently, and probably still, you have to prefix uh, ClipPath because some browsers only support it with a prefix, namely Safari and other versions of Chrome and so on. So, of course, if you have to prefix a lot of properties, you can use auto prefixer or prefix me or whatever. But what if you, if you only want to prefix one property, you can actually use a workaround with CSS variables. So what I've done here is I've used the trick to cancel inheritance, as we've seen earlier, because we don't want clip path to inherit. And then I'm setting WebKit clip path and clip path to the value of the clip path variable. So basically, I can now use here. I can now use clip path as if I, I was using the actual clip path property and it works exactly the same. Almost. It's not animatable. But unless, if you're not animating clip path, it basically works exactly the same. Now let's try to use it. Let's do a diamond clip path. So this will, it will take a while until you start seeing something. There's something happening. And then it's zero for the vertically. 50% vertically. There's our dynamic shape. And as you can see, now I'm applying it to all, div, uh, to all divs. Uh, so I, I get clip path null divs. I can only apply it to block one. I can apply it to the div inside block one. It works exactly the same. And it's basically <laughs> setting these two properties. So Another takeaway is that CSS variables enable you to set multiple properties at once. Another cool thing I could do with variables, although this is kind of a trivial, not very useful use case, um, you can basically create what I call single property mixins. If you want to pre, if you have, if you have a property that takes many arguments, and you want to pre-fill some of them, you can use variables for that. So here I've created my own purple shadow property that works exactly the same as box shadow, but it doesn't have a color argument. The color is automatically always Rebecca purple. And it works exactly the same as normal box shadow in every other way. And I can choose which arguments I want to pre-fill. If I want to pre-fill the offsets so that the only thing I customize with my purple shadow property is the blur, I can do that. So CSS variables that can create single property mixins. We're still not there with multi-property mixins. There used to be an app apply rule that is now abundant. But at least with single property mixins, you're covered. This might remind you of function carrying if you're right, if you if you're a programmer. Another cool thing you can do is basically create your own long hands. One of the things I don't like about, about box shadow is that even though it looks like a shorthand, it's actually not. You, there are no separate box shadow something properties. I think there should be, but they're not. And you can fake this with CSS variables. So here, I've, it looks like a lot of code, but this is just canceling inheritance for all of these properties. As you can see, this is something you use a lot. And then it's, specific, it's, it's um, setting box shadow based on all these properties. And they all have fallbacks except blur, which means that you will have to absolutely use, so you have to set box shadow blur to use this. Because um, every CSS shortcut has a property like this, like something that you have to set, the CFF. And in this case, we chose blur. So let's set that to 1M. And you can see I'm already seeing something. And let me set box shadow color to, I don't know, red. And now, on hover, I'm setting box. Whoa. Hmm. I've seen this box before. Oh, looks good. This worked. OK. And then you can set box shadow color to say blue. It's not going to be pretty, but as you can see, it works. 
It's exactly the, shape, the same shadow, and I only had to override Hawk Shadow Color. So it sort of works like a shortcut. So the, four, the, the fourteenth takeaway is that CSS variables enable you to create your own custom DOM handle. And here I'm creating a, a property that I sort of always wanted to have, like a prepend property, where you don't have to write a, 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 CS, a whole CSS rule. You can just use the prepend property and, a, and prepend some text to wherever you want. Let's do it on every div here. As you can see, um, I didn't have to write any generated content uh, rules. Just just use this prepend property as and as I would any other property, or only the inside ones, or just log one. Uh, you see, it doesn't inherit because I canceled the inheritance here. Um, the HTML is exactly the same as all the similar examples we've seen. Um, and you can see how it works here. And of course, just like every other CSS variable, I can go to the inline style here. And well, if I take care of the quotes, yeah. As you can see here, I can use the inline style as well. So another takeaway is CSS variables enable to, to define your own properties. So some of you, especially those that have code SVG, how many hand code SVG to some degree? Ooh, quite a few. So you might be wondering, can I use CSS variables in there to make things easier? And the answer is yes. So here we have two eyes. Here's the SVG for those two eyes. The important one is the iris here. And I have this CSS rule here that sets the iris, uh, the center of the circle that creates the iris, to 50 pixels. <laughs> And yes, these days you can use CSS properties to set even geometrical CSS uh, SVG attributes. And as you can see, if I change this property, the circle moves. But it's kind of arbitrary, like to make the eye look all the way, is it left or right? Right. right. I'm terrible with left or right. <laughs> Especially when it's all mirrored in a projector and I have to like think some more about it. Anyway, to make it look that way, it's 25 pixels. To make it look the other way, it's 75 pixels. It's kind of arbitrary. So I create a variable that goes from 0 to 1. Let's set it to 0.5. And here, I use calc. 25 pixels is the minimum. And then plus 50 pixels multiplied by this variable. And now, I can just change this variable. And it's a reasonable value. It's a percentage of how much it looks left. All right. So CSS variables plus SVG equals no. What about CSS variables plus JavaScript? I gave you a hint earlier that you can indeed set and get them by JavaScript. There's not a new API for this, actually. It just uses the same methods that element.style or uh, the elements had for years. For decades. For example, if you want to get the value, a, a variable from the inline style, you just call uh, element.style get property value. If you want to get uh, the computed value of the variable, like the, the value uh, including like cascading from style sheets and everything, you just get the computed style and you use get property value again. You're probably not very used to get property value uh, because for normal CSS properties, you just use the camel case version. But it exists. You can use it for normal CSS properties as well. And because variables don't have a common case version, that's the only thing you can use. Uh, and to set it on an, on an inline style, you just use set property. Now, why is it set property and get property value instead of, like I don't know, something consistent, like get property? I don't know. The older the API, the less sense it makes. But you can basically use these to get set CSS variables. and you can use any existing CSSOM method as well. Like all these method that, the methods that let you modify style sheets and add declarations in style sheets, you can use those with variables as well. Like everything works. They're just normal CSS properties. That's the whole point. Nothing new needs to be added and supported by browsers. Just, uh, just variables. No new API, nothing. 
So what can we do with this? Let's look at some cool examples. We can set two variables based on the mouse position. We only need to set it at one event listener in the document. And we're setting uh, these variables to like a percentage of how far the mouse has moved left and right. Um, this is an event uh, of the entire document. Uh, I'm setting, uh, I'm getting the, the horizontal and vertical position percentages and I'm setting two variables with it. Pretty simple stuff, right? Now, what can we do with that? Here we have a radial gradient with its center fixed to the center of the screen. But I can make it more interesting. Instead of 50%, I can say 100% multiplied by the value of the mouse x variable. And now as I'm moving my mouse, the center of the gradient changes. And I can do this with the vertical position as well. And look, now I can move my mouse and the center of the gradient changes. And what's even more important is that this enables a decoupling of JavaScript and CSS that was never possible before. If I want to change my CSS, let's say like this. I don't, if, if I'm the, the, in the past, if I was the same person that, that's writing the CSS and the JavaScript, great. But if it was a separate person, like a separate developer team that was writing the JavaScript, then I had to go to them and say, actually, I want to make a change. And they're like, gosh, you designers always change everything. I hate you. Why do you make my job so hard? Well, none of this anymore. 